Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We're now into module number three. And thank you again for staying on top of module number one and number two as far as the deadlines. And thank you so much for checking in. If I haven't heard from you yet, please make sure that I do hear from you. Obviously, I need to make sure that, you know, I think in worst case scenario, make sure I've got your cell phone number at least. Looking at digital audio, as far as digital audio is concerned, we really do have to understand what analog sound is in order for us to understand how we're capturing digital sound. So analog sound changes continuously, and it has an infinite number of possible states. So I think a really good way to look at it is like a dimmer switch. So if you've seen those lights, you know, you can basically rotate a dial and it can be as dim or as bright as you want. There's basically an infinite amount of values of on and off. It's not just about being on or off, right? Now that's very different as far as, anal as, far as digital versus analog. Digital has a fixed number of possible states. And that's where we got into the idea of binary code. Binary code is really interesting because there really are only two states. It's on and off, zeros and ones. And the weird thing about binary code as far as, you know, digitizing analog or even in terms of what we see in, in picture, television and film, you know, pictures, um, anything that we're using on our phone, everything that we see and everything that we hear is organized within this binary code of zeros and ones. I find it fascinating and at the same token, you know, as we start looking at certain pieces of gear, what we digitize from the analog world, we're using microphones, you know, we're using, you know, any way that we can get the outside world into our computer. When we digitize that sound, we have to have some type of a box or some type of a converter to do that. And we'll talk about that. And hopefully that's one of the, you know, big reasons why you're here in the class. It was one of the reasons why I took these classes, you know, 25 years ago. I wanted to learn how that, you know, how I could professionally digitize sound because sound was going away from analog tape and it was getting into computers and it was getting into, at that time, high 8 tape and things like that, which you don't see anymore. But most importantly, as far as digitized sound, this fixed number of states at zero and one, when we look at an analog waveform, it's smooth, it's continuous. But when we look at a digital sound wave, you're going to see steps. Now, with that said, that all has to do with also your fidelity of how you're capturing that digital signal. Fidelity meaning your quality. Let me show you what I mean. I've got a pretty good sounding Rhodes here. I've just got this little clip. I'll just play it for you. Put it on a little loop here. Nothing to it. It's just a little Rhodes. But watch what happens when I zoom in on it. You see how this looks, you know, like a pretty nice waveform, right? But of course, this is digital. When I zoom in, you're going to see those little lines. You see that? Now, it is pretty finite, and it does sound really good. And for most people, you're really not going to hear that. But that's why we say in terms of analog sound, analog sound sounds very warm, sounds very real. A big part of that is, is that in terms of digital sound, sometimes we might potentially be perceiving these imperfections. So what is sampling then? This is one of my favorite parts about this, this class. As far as sampling, sampling is when the analog to digital converter measures the amplitude of the incoming waveform some number of times every second and assigns a numerical value to the amplitude. So your A to D, your analog to digital converter, is measuring everything that's happening from your microphone into the converter, and then it's going to assign that numerical value, which we end up recording into our computer. Very, very simple, right? So one more time, the analog to digital, digital converter, when you're sampling, measures the amplitude of the incoming waveform some number of times every second and assigns a numerical value to the amplitude. So that's where you get the term sample rate. And you can change these rates and you know you're gonna find that certain devices for example this Apollo twin will allow you to be able to take signals and record these signals so in this particular case this Apollo twin has two microphones in and two microphones out and then it allows you to take the signal out from this device into you know some speakers and this is going to you know allow you to have a lot better quality so in my case for example right now I'm just using my built-in computer and that's okay, but I can't really record a microphone if I want to. Right now, the way that you hear me is, is I'm, I've got a microphone that's built in my computer, and we know that that's certainly not going to be the ultimate quality. Someday, we might want to get one of those devices that will allow us to be able to do that, right? But right now that I'm built in, I've got certain aspects that will allow me to be able to change my sample rate. 
So if I go into record settings in Logic, GarageBand, Live, Pro Tools, it doesn't matter what it is, we're going to check out our recording settings, and our recording settings are going to allow us to change our sample rate. And again, I'm going to be going over and over and over this. And in fact, I plan on working with each and every one of you if you decide to build a system or as you're putting your system together so that we can make sure that you know where all these parameters are. But as far as this class, I'm just kind of showing you here within Logic that I would be able to, with my built-in settings, change the sample rate to a certain level. But remember, if I wanted to go to the ultimate, like we learned in the last module, 192 HD, 192 kilohertz, that is going to be oversampling upon oversampling, you know, being able to get the ultimate signal that we could get. But at the same time, as you can see here, I don't have access to that. In order for me to get to the ultimate sample rate, I actually do have to buy one of these devices. So those devices will all link into your computer, of course. And, you know, I really i am excited to tell you that some of them don't necessarily have to cost that much money. This is the, the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, and it's what we have at the school for you. And as you can see, we could plug in two microphones if we wanted to, and you can turn it up or turn it down in this particular case, and it's going to digitize your sample rate. And that Focusrite, believe it or not, I'm happy to tell you, just like your I.O. from Universal Audio, it will allow you to record HD signal. Isn't that cool? 192 kilohertz. And so with that, as we start looking at exactly what we're doing in terms of frequency and frequency response, that's all this really is. We're responding to the frequencies that exist in the real world so that we can accept them into the computer. And so our quality really will have to do with these devices so that we can you know, respond to the frequency that exists in the world. One of the ultimate IOs is this guy here. This is the Avid IO. And the Avid IO, this costs a lot of money. We've got it at the school for you at Cypress, and I'm, I really hate saying that to you as we're taking an online class, of course, but at some point in the future, I'm hoping that you'll be able to utilize this. The beauty of the one here, this Avid I.O., and hopefully you'll look at this guy too online, it has 16 microphones in and 16 microphone channels out. So we could have 16 mics, we could record 16 mics all in, at one time live, and we could also send signals out so we could put it to certain outboard gear, we could you know, have a bunch of different speakers or whatever we decide to do. But it's very, very powerful to be able to get the ultimate signal quality in this particular case from Pro Tools. And really it's you know probably about, you know again, I know it's a lot of money, but this guy here being the ultimate in the world, it's still under about 10,000 bucks. I think that's a pretty good deal. The beauty of the Scarlet that we were just looking at, that's under $200. And that will allow you to be able to record HD. Let's look at that Apollo. The Apollo is a little under $1,000. And the same idea. It's going to allow you to be able to record a couple microphone channels in. You can send the signal out to speakers. But really, what are we looking at? We're looking at being able to record the ultimate sample rate. Just some suggestions. Of course, there's several out there. I'm sure some of you may potentially have some that are a little bit different, but most importantly, these devices allow us to be able to link into our sample rate, right? So going back to any DAW that we're using, if I had that device that we just looked at, any of them, I would be able to change my sample rate all the way to 192, no problem. Now, that sample rate again, like we were just talking, the number of samples taken per second. So when we talk about CD quality digital audio, CD quality is 44.1, 44.1. So basically what that essentially means is, is then, as I'm working, and it doesn't matter what DAW, when I want to actually give you a stereo file, when I want everybody to be able to play it in their car, and then they can go back and you know check it on, on you know, let's say iTunes or anything else, anytime I submit something, what we're really doing in audio is we're bouncing it. We're, and when we bounce it, that's essentially in the same world as video, it's called rendering. And really all it is, is, is we're just basically sending out our mix or we're sending out our stereo file. So if you can see here on my stereo out, you see this little button that says bounce. Or if I go to file, you can see bounce. The beauty of this again is, is that any time that you're working in any DAW, it doesn't matter what it is, when you bounce something, you're going to be able to get to these parameters as well. So as you can see here, then everything that we just talked about, I would be able to now change my sample rate from that bounce. 
But if we know that CD quality is 44.1, we're going to keep it right there. So here is the magic trick then. If anybody asks us for anything else as far as a different stereo mix or a different frequency response in the stereo mix, and if they say they're working in film and they say that they need the stereo out to be 48, no problem. Nothing to it. What if they say that they need the stereo out to be HD? For example, Dead Mouse says that you can buy his music in the ultimate HD. He calls it in all its glory. So what that means essentially is, is that you're going to buy his music at 192. Here's the problem with that. When I go to my grandma's house, my grandma has a CD player that you could just go and buy from any, any normal store, right? So that CD player, when you put that CD, the CD on the CD player, if the CD is any different sample rate other than 44.1, the CD will not play. So food for thought, the ultimate aspect of looking at us in terms of professionals when it comes down to us working for a major label, when it comes down to us working for certain clients, we probably want to make sure that we will always at least give them a bounce at 44.1 to make sure that you know in their if they're making a cd and if somebody's playing it on a consumer cd player that we know that the cd player will be able to play that back because that's the frequency response that the, the cd player is tuned to isn't that interesting so one of the things and i learned the hard way i accidentally bounced out a track and i bounced it out the wrong, the wrong frequency response i went to turn it in and unfortunately the client sent back that they couldn't play it and so I had to figure out exactly what happened, and I realized that I had the wrong sample rate. I wasn't set to my CD quality. So with that said, anything that you turn in, in this class, again, I don't require that you have this gear. I don't require that you have these DAWs. I will have alternate ways that you can get the same points. But if you do have this gear, and if you want to turn in a project, and if, if we want to go back and forth and to try to really shape something, let me know because I would love to help you. And in the case of that, I'm going to make sure that we know exactly what we're doing when it comes down to bouncing and making sure that if, as you're turning something in, it's exactly the quality that we're looking for. So I do hope that helps you. As far as sample rate is concerned, remember that those devices that we just saw too, wasn't that cool that we could actually change the sample rate as we're recording something? So just imagine this then. If I had those devices... And if I'm actually recording something, I could record with those devices all the way up to HD. And the best part, I'm in my house or I'm in my bedroom, right? How cool is that? Recording HD. And if you buy the Focusrite, for example, you could get HD quality for just a couple hundred dollars. Isn't that neat? So again, and as I know you guys took the quizzes, I'm not asking you to memorize anything or anything like that. Of course, you can always use your notes and go back to it. One of the things that really it took me a while to wrap my head around so i wanted to just basically articulate this in a little bit different way so it's a little easier for us right but at the beginning levels of understanding exactly our frequency response and how we hear let's look at the nyquist frequency the nyquist frequency is very simple it's digital audio can contain no frequency higher than half the sample rate so we note that our human hearing is from 20 to 20,000, right and that's how we're setting our EQ and things like that. It really helps us to understand, especially with the parametric EQ, when we're analyzing these frequencies, if we want to boost lows or highs, we can really perceive that. We can see it so much so in terms of, especially if we're using logic with our awesome EQ, right? 20 to 20K. Obviously, lows, mids, and highs. But... The Nyquist frequency, I find, you know, in the sense of when we think about CD quality, remember CD quality is at 44.1. That is twice our human hearing, or a little more, of course, right? So essentially when we think of twice our human hearing, that's going to be 40,000 or a little bit above, correct? So the highest frequency that CD quality audio could contain is 21,050 hertz. So 21,050 hertz is above the human audio range. And now with that said, twice our human hearing, that's where we get this 44.1. It's basically 20,000 times 2, right? So another aspect, and we've talked about this, higher sample rates. Why would you use a higher sample rate? Well, if we know the CD quality is 44.1, we should just stick to you know CD quality 44.1. Not all clients are going to be you know, happy with that. They might potentially, let's say we've got a, you know, really high end client that's playing only a piano. They're going to want a higher sample rate. They're going to want us to record their piano part at HD quality. 
and uh, we're going to take that really nice device and we're going to set it up to 192, right? Or maybe 96K. As I'm working with some of the biggest names in the business, as some of you guys know, was really lucky I got to work with a cat by the name of Howie Weinberg. I've worked with him for many, many years. And one of the things I notice is when he sends his clients out mixes and masters, he usually sends them out as 96 kilohertz. He's not worried about CD quality 44.1 or people being able, because he knows that I'm going to convert that myself, right? I can easily go in here and make my own bounces and convert my own bounces. But the reason that he's giving me that quality is very simply because when I go to iTunes, iTunes will have two different ways that we can sell our music. We've got a regular download or we've got a download for high definition. Have you seen that? So you get these really cool things where you've got a, a track that you could buy for $1.29 and it's called Mastered for iTunes. But it's really simple. Now that you've taken this module, you understand exactly what that's all about. You, are, When you are selling something that is high definition, mastered for iTunes, what you are doing is, is you're giving iTunes a bounce that is the highest sample rate that you could give them. And in the case of Howie Weinberg, he gives them 96K. Of course, he could go higher than that, but 96K is his standard. And he'll send iTunes the 96K bounce, and iTunes will then convert that, and then you've got that high-definition download that you can sell for more. Now, think of that for a second. That's a gimmick, isn't it? To be able to push a button and to get a little bit more response out of it and to sell that track for 30 cents more, it's really just simply a button push. Once I learned that game, I realized that I can sell high-definition downloads, I could sell CD quality downloads all the way down the line. Hopefully for some of you, that will turn out to be a business for you like it has for me. Now, it's not just about sample rate, but it's also about bit depth. Sample rate has to do with how we capture frequency. When we talk about bit depth, when we talk about quantizing something, we're talking about capturing amplitude or volume. And that's the other aspect to recording, right? So we want to make sure that not only are we cap capturing the ultimate frequencies, but we also want to capture the ultimate amplitude. So here's what we get in terms of what quantizing is. Quantizing is when the analog to digital converter, or the A to, D, A to D to C, must assign a numeric value for the incoming continuous analog signal. Data that falls in between numeric values is rounded to the closest value. This is where we get what's called bit depth. Bit depth is the number of values that are available for the analog to digital converter to measure the amplitude of the incoming waveform at each sample. So, one bit, two values. Two bits, four values. But watch what happens as we continue on. It's exponential. Three bits is eight values. Eight bits is 256 values. 16 bits, 65,536 values. 24 bit, almost 17 million values. So when you think of bit depth and when you think of sample rate, I think of a television screen. Remember back in the day when we bought a TV and it was at 720, 720 pixels, and you know we were all excited. 720, whoa. I could actually see the basketball when I'm watching basketball. And before, you couldn't hardly see anything. We just got used to it, right? Then all of a sudden, we get 1080. And now we've got this HD quality and, and on and on, and it's only going to get better. But really, what are we doing? We're filling in these spaces. And it is no different in terms of audio. It's just that we're perceiving it a little bit different. So when we think of bit depth now, this is how I'd like to think of it. Sample rate and bit depth. Sample rate from left to right, bit depth, obviously in terms of understanding our value from, you know, it's basically um, vertical. So we've got our sample rate, and in terms of a lower resolution, you can see we can hardly bring back that waveform. But as we get a little bit higher resolution, look what happens here. Now we start getting a little bit less error. Now, on top of it, if we get a higher resolution, almost HD, we get very little error. It's almost perfect at that point, right? So the best way that we could put it, the higher the sample rate and the higher the bit depth, the better your resolution. Another way to look at it, in 16-bit, you can see here we still get some of these picks when we're trying to clean up this perfect analog waveform. We're really going to get some blocks to that. 
Now in 24-bit, you can see we get a little bit resolution. Now it's, uh, our frequency response is set, right? But if we change our sample rate, and if we change our bit depth, we're really getting close to that waveform. Being able to physically fill in these spaces so that it will create the contour of that wave. So now let's go back to the waveform and you can really see what's happening here, right? So I'll zoom in and that contour above and below that line, we're filling it in okay. But if I was to record this, I could probably make this sound even better, couldn't I? Recorded HD maybe potentially, you never know. Now, as far as bit depth is concerned, we saw that you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Of course, I'm just going to call this up real quick. We'll just get a nice little loop on this. Now, what would happen? Not bad, right? Now, it's supposed to sound pretty good. At this point, we look at our frequency response of where our track is. Let's check it out. I think we're at 44.1, right? As far as our resolution. Yep. Now, how do I change my bit depth? Well, one of the things I definitely want to point out as far as, you know, logic is concerned, if we look here at our preferences, as far as Pro Tools, as far as Ableton Live, FL Studio, we're going to be able to change our preferences and we're going to be able to change our bit depth. Be very careful. Because if in Logic this is unchecked, you are now mixing and recording in 16-bit. 16-bit, going back to what we looked at into our notes, 16-bit is 65,536 levels. So when we think of filling in a, a television in terms of pixels, that's not going to be the ultimate resolution for us. So with a simple button push, we could get to 17 million levels in terms of how our resolution is set when we're mixing, when we're mastering, when we're recording. I highly suggest getting everything set to 24-bit. So in order to do that, just simply check it. It's really that easy. So one more time. In your Logic preference, or in Pro Tools preference, or in Live's preference, you'll go to your recording settings and just simply make sure that you're set to 24-bit. You'll even see in today's world certain DAWs might even allow you to be able to get to 32-bit. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. If now I'm in 24-bit, I have to have an enormous amount of storage space. I have to have at least, you know, hard drive, something like that, because I'm going to fill up this little computer that I'm showing you this, this you know, example on quick if I'm recording everything in 24-bit, you know, high sample rate, right? So one of my suggestions to you is, is just to make sure that you understand that when you do record in 24-bit, and I suggest that you do, make sure that you have a way to store it because it's going to be a lot larger file. But I hope that makes sense. Sample rate and bit depth have to do with your quality, and you can easily change that you know, within any DAW. In Logic, we can change our sample rate and our bit depth when we get started to record. So my preference in recording, here's my bit depth. My sample rate is in record, recording settings, and in audio. And I can change my sample rate. Every DAW will allow you to do this. This is just where Logix is set. But isn't that cool? We can easily change these parameters so that we can do all of these things that we see all the major you know, studios and producers doing, essentially, right? On the flip side, when we're done, we can send the signal and we can create a mix or bounce our project or section and we can make that 24-bit or we can make that a sample rate, right? We can change this down and look at there. I could even make this 32-bit on top of it. So I do note that I've been able to buy some Dead Mouse tracks at a 32-bit float 192. And you can buy them you know, online. If you look on his website, for example, you'll see that you'll be able to download this at that resolution. It does definitely sound, uh, you know, especially in the car here. I've got a tuned car um, with a little subwoofer and everything. Pretty nice speakers. It really sounds nice. That's it, there's definitely a difference. And you can see why people, uh, you know, they pay a little bit more for that. But for the most part, you can see we've got access to every parameter. Isn't that cool? Again, bounce is basically just sending out a mix.
So, keep on going here. We're just about done. The higher the bid depth, the better the resolution is shown in the diagram, right? So this idea of signal to error ratio, this is my disclaimer of why you're going to probably want some of these devices, why you're going to want to understand all of these different parameters. The signal to error ratio is the ratio of the overall signal to the sampling error. So sampling errors introduce a small amount of noise to the system. Higher bit depths and quality analog to digital converters mean more signal and less error. So going back, if you buy these devices, you're going to have less signal error. It's going to sound a lot better coming back out of your speakers. And better resolution, of course, is going to be a better track overall, I promise. And when it comes down to it, you don't necessarily have to spend millions and millions of dollars. You really don't. But I do have to say that it's going to take a, a, you know, a little investment if you're looking at creating true, true quality that you know, is, is going to be able to be competitive in the business. It's not hard, though, I promise you that. So higher bit depth and quality analog digital converter is definitely the way to go. So continuing on, what are file formats? Well, file formats are what we're recording and exactly what we're selling. And so we really want to understand the aspect of what is a professional uncompressed file format versus what is going to be, let's just say, a representative, a, a you know, a kind of a, a crunchy picture or something like that, basically, right? We want the ultimate. And we want to note that if we're giving somebody something that's not the ultimate, there's going to be reasons for that, maybe streaming or something like that. But realistically, when we're talking about high definition, the ultimate file format, we're looking at uncompressed file formats. File formats are digital audio that's stored in a file format that determines what type of information is in the file and how it's organized on the disk. So for us in audio, the ultimate is the uncompressed file format. Digital audio is stored as a series of 16 or 24-bit amplitude values. The most uncompressed, or the most common uncompressed file format is AIFF or WAVE. Now, CD quality, when you buy and sell a CD and you go to the store, it's going to be 44-1, 16-bit. 44-1, 16-bit. Now, when you buy our CDs, or if you're going to go and get a, a, you know, I sell our USB drives, or if you're going to go and buy a dead mouse CD, if you're going to go and check out and get the ultimate Calvin Harris download, you're going to have 24 bit in terms of that download. You're going to see that output. But if you go buy a Calvin Harris CD at Target or a dead mouse CD at Target, you will see that that CD is 16 bit 44 1. So something to note that when it's on a tangible medium on a CD, Oftentimes it's at 16 bit. And as you guys note, just going back to this idea of resolution, you can see why I love making high definition downloads. And I love being able to sell our high definition, you know, quality AIFF files and WAV files. So let's look at that. An AIFF file or a WAV file. It's really easy. When I get started, it's even going to ask me, you know, what type of file. So in this case, we can go to our preferences and we can just kind of see, you know, exactly what file we are creating in this case, right? So in this case, you can see I've got, obviously, our recording settings have our sample rate. And then our preferences, we'll see what we're sampling. AIFF or WAVE, either or, they're essentially the same. There is no difference. If a client asks me for a WAVE file versus an AIFF file, I'm not going to give them a lecture and tell them that they're the same or anything like that. I'm just going to simply give them a WAVE file. But just so that you note, AIFF or WAVE are uncompressed files. That is the ultimate information, right? All its glory. So AIFF or WAVE, that's how we're going to get started to record. Most importantly, when we turn something in at the end, when we bounce something, we will also be able to create either a WAVE or AIFF. My clients always want WAVEs, but an AIFF does not change. Here's the funny thing. If you have a PC and you take a CD, you're going to take that CD, you're going to put in that, that file, and that file is always going to be WAVE. If you've got an Apple computer and you take that same CD and you put that CD into the Apple, it's going to show up as AIFF. Isn't that interesting? They are essentially the same. Now, I just kind of point that out because I don't want to create any confusion, especially when you are making money in the future and, and clients are asking you for a bounce 
you can bounce them whatever they want. If they don't ask, you know, give them AFF or WAVE. It's totally up to you. But if they do ask, just simply give them what they want. It's really, really quite simple. AIFF for WAVE. That in this class is going to be, I think, one of the ultimate things that you're going to want to take. That when we sell something, if we're looking to try to make something HD, those are our file formats, right? Now, what is then an MP3, an MP4? What's this all about? Well, let's get this guy up here. First and foremost, let's look at how this works. With an MP3 and MP4, this is a representation of your AIF or your WAV file. It's, uh, it's hopefully close, but it's not totally exactly an AIF or WAV. So how they create this algorithm, we're looking at lossless compressed file formats. And so there's two sides to it, lossless and lossy, when we create an MP3, when we convert. Lossless is when we reduce the size of an audio file up to 50%, in a way that the original data is perfectly recovered. So, for example, if you have a FLAC file or you know a zip, you can double click on the zip, the zip will open up and then you will have your waveform from the zip, right? But if it's in a zip file and you just leave it there, you can't go to your grandma's house and play that on the CD player. You'd have to go to a computer, double click it, as long as you've got it now on, you know, and then you burn it to a CD or something, that zip file will now be that perfect AIFF file. Another thing I like to point out is, is that on my phone, it is perfectly recovered if I've got a, an iPhone or if I've got you know, any type of phone that's playing a digital signal back, it will play back the sound, right? It'll play back the song. But if I don't have that phone and it's got the, the MP3 file, I certainly can't put that to a CD player if it doesn't have access to MP3 or MP4. There's a lot of CD players, especially in the 90s, that would not give you access to an MP3 or MP4. So some you know, CD players, or you'd buy a certain stereo system, and that stereo system would actually be pretty expensive because it had MP3 or MP4 capability. Now it's obvious that every car has that, right? But something to note, you are going to be able to recover your data within an MP3, MP4, in this particular case, zip file. It's, it's almost perfect, but there's a problem. Lossy is when you reduce the size of an audio file in a way that the original data cannot be perfectly recovered. And that's the problem that we have when we make MP3s and MP4s and FLAC files. So we decrease the size of the file, which is beautiful, don't get me wrong. MP3s and MP4s are, are very important for me because I don't have to make millions of CDs to sell millions of downloads. I just have to make one. Isn't that interesting? So that if somebody's going to download our music, as long as I make one CD or as long as I make you know one mix, then you can just basically digitally have a bunch of different you know representations of that. I think that's beautiful and I think that that's definitely something that I have to point out. It's been very 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 valuable for me as a professional. But one thing I do want to point out, especially for those of you in hip-hop and EDM, when I'm looking at not being able to bring back everything perfectly, some of the things that it takes away, low end, some of the things that it takes away, the loudest sound wins. So for example on an MP3, MP4, sometimes it sounds like the vocals really really present. Um, if you buy the actual AIFF or WAVE in high definition, the vocal may not sound that same way. Um, certain other aspects, of course, that, you know, I just, when it comes down to it, we can also change the different bit rate to be able to hopefully make that a better resolution output. So let me show you how that works here. So we are done with this awesome song. We've got everything rolling. I've got this Rhodes part set, and I'm going to bounce this out. Now, we know the ultimate is going to be AIFF 24-bit 44.1 because we want to bounce this to a stereo system. But our client says, you know what? I need to be able to convert this to an MP3. No problem. Let's check an MP3. And as you see here, let's just look at exactly what we've just studied. You see where we have our bit rate? I in my notes have just stated that in terms of 256 we could hardly tell much of a difference between CD quality. Right? Now that's powerful. Why? Because now that you know what you know you could open up all the way up past that point. On top of that now you know that when you create an mp3 you're going to be losing certain elements of quality. So do I want to filter frequencies below 10 hertz in EDM? 
or hip hop. Well, if I filter frequencies below 10 hertz, remember 10 hertz, that's our lows, right? So think about this. Filtering frequencies below 10. Well, we know our human hearing is 20, right? So 20, but then I'm going to start cutting things way back at this point. In my car, you're cutting away the part that hits me in the chest, right? That's, that's what we want in terms of our kick drum. That's what we want with our ultimate sub basses and things like that. So my disclaimer to you is, is definitely don't do that. Make sure that when we create our MP3 file, we don't have that checked. We don't want to filter that out. And of course, we want to use the best encoding that we can. We hit OK. Now we've got our awesome MP3 file that's going to be located wherever we decide to direct it. And I'll get to this in the next module here in module four. We'll talk about opening up a file, directing the file, getting started, you know, all of the all the fun stuff as far as, you know, getting started working in production of, of our first track. But most importantly, we know many, many aspects of quality in and quality out. When we record something, we can start with the ultimate quality, couldn't we? And then most importantly, we could also end with the ultimate quality as well. Sample rate and bit depth, as far as your fidelity or your quality of audio goes hand in hand. And hopefully now, you're a lot closer to an expert. I really do wish these are some of the things that I knew early on. It would have saved me a lot of money when I was, you know, basically working with certain clients and sending certain people through my learning curve, you know, some quality records that weren't necessarily as good as they could have been. I could have turned in several mixes and several masters that would have been exponentially better if I would have just understood very, very simple tricks that we've just covered. So I hope that helps. Most importantly, everything that we've got here essentially is all reviewable. Feel free to check it out as many times as you wish. Most importantly, please continue to make sure checking in with me is uh, it's a very valuable or a very uh, um, a vital aspect of this class. I think it's also very valuable too because remember, usually on online classes, if you take a class and the class isn't live, I'm going to give you all of this stuff on just a PowerPoint. You're going to read through it and then you're going to take the quiz and you'll never hear from me. Um, you, know, you won't be able to ask questions. You'll basically just take the quiz and that'll be the end of it. I've taken several classes like that. I want to make sure that you note that I'm always here for you. So if you need me, just remember, feel free. You've got several ways to get a hold of me. Call me, email me. Most importantly, I'm on Comp or Zoom. I'm all over the place. Let me know if you need anything, okay, guys? Take care.